Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. As we come to learn the Pasha, the week together, uh, holding on Pasha's by Yishlach. This is my cough. <laughs> but um, we, will, uh, we will survive. Um, today is Pasha's by Yishlach, and it's on page. One fifty, no, one thirty nine. One thirty nine. Yes. Page one thirty nine in your book. I want to want to remind everybody that uh, to not remind to tell everybody that this book is coming to slowly to an end. And if you uh, those especially on Zoom, if you want the book, you need a, you should order the book. I'll tell Rifka to send out a a. Uh, a link to order a new book. Thank you so much. Uh, with the... Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. No, we uh, thank you very much. So, um, the fascinating Pasha, the Pasha, the fascinating Pasha in general, the uh, the meaning of Yaakov and Esav, uh, but the Rebbe Sikha here is going to be on the story that happened in the middle of the portion. The story of Dina. Dina, the daughter of uh, of uh, Leah and Yaakov, who go out, who goes out to the city of Shechem, and she has this encounter with um, with uh, with the oops, sorry, she has an encounter with the son of Hamer, um, which is the um, the. Oh, I can, oh, yeah, it's, Which is the son of the? Uh, I'm just trying to fix this. Does it look clear this video on Zoom? Yes, very good. Oh, it's good. Okay. So uh, with the story of, of of Dina who goes out and she has a relationship with the um, with the son of the uh, leader of Shechem, of, of, of Shechem, which is Hamer. He loves his son Shechem so much that he called the city Shechem. They're talking about a very special prince. Who uh, does a despicable act, and he wants to uh, fix the situation. So he goes to the to the Yaakov and his sons, and he asks them to uh, to let him marry uh, the daughter of of let him marry the girl Dina. But the sons of Yaakov are extremely angry with what happened, and they you know not. Uh, you know, not to, not coming back and saying what happened. You know, the, the the terrible act. You know, trying to fix it by just getting married is not the uh, is not the uh, talking about the actual deed of this uh, terrible situation. So they come up with a plan, and the plan is that all the men, if they want to, uh, they want this marriage to happen. All Yisaf Moshem has to circumcise himself. And all the men, uh, and then they, the Shem goes to the entire population and introduces this project, and all the guys circumcise themselves. Crazy situation. <laughs> so we're going to introduce you to the verse, text number 1a, page 139. He came and passed the third day. When the inhabitants of Shem were all in pain, so often they stood. No kidding. Thank God they do it at eight days old. <laughs> the two sons of Yankim, Shimon and Levi, Ache, Dina, the two, the, the brothers of Levi, the brother of Dina, Ishchabe, these two guys took their swords. And they came upon the city with confidence. And they killed all males. Do you know how many people there were? Doesn't say the quantity. Surely more than 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 the than, 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 than the two. Yeah, yeah. So uh, whatever it doesn't say exactly the amount of people. And they killed all the men. And Yaakov himself was like shocked. Yaakov himself was shocked. How, how do you do this? Are you kidding me? Go oh, and kill all the all the people of the city. This is like a violent act. 
contact. We know that Yaakov Avinu really rebukes these two sons, Shem and Levi, later when he's on his deathbed. He then lashes into these two boys, these two guys, Shem and Levi. But right now he says, like, what are you putting me in danger, right, in the, in the, in the country? And their answer is simple. In text number one B: Will our sisters be made a harlot? What are you? What are we? What, are we, what is this situation? This is a this is a beautiful girl, and she's put into a. Now it's in essence. Oh, we weren't going to blame the. If, if we allow this, and that's what we're saying. Oh, she was part of this uh, this conspiracy. She was part of this deed. You know. Oh, she wanted to be raped. And now she becomes the wife of the raper. And uh, this is, uh, was a consensual act. Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. This cannot be allowed. And this guy's had to be punished. And we had to do what we had to do. Now, the truth is, it's a, this is a big question, how they did this. This is not just a simple, Yaakov Avinu's question to them is a good question. What is their answer? And that's why you see in text number 140, you have a figure number one. You have different explanations to their action, okay? The people were established. The people should have established a court of justice. They felt that this was an act that needed to be brought to court and brought the prince up in charges. This is a rape. And, in those, and you know, rape was death penalty. The third... The Torah, Torah, it's not, but if the person is not married, but and she was not a married woman, but uh, the courts of justice, God want the, the, to the nations of the world, they could have, they could judge rape as a death penalty. And the Torah says that it's not consensual. Or not, not consensual. So failing to do though, so, so in essence, for them not to create a court of justice, which was one of the seven Noahide laws, they were all complicit in this act. Now, some understood they were afraid to do that because he was the king. It's hard to... Uh, uh, Shamer was the uh, prince. Okay. But there's a big difference. That nobody is above justice. And uh, to let this guy... What's the matter? To let this guy out, so to say, and to let him... Do what he wants was an illegal act. He was no. the king. Was the Hamer was the so to say the king or the exactly what he was. He was surely a leader in in, in the. Yeah. the it was, it was a, he was a don. Uh, don yeah. The peep number two yeah. Nachmanides. That's what my writes. writes. Nachmanini says the people were guilty of many other capital sins, such as idolatry, adultery, and other happenings. So therefore, they were not such a holy group anyway. Abchayim ben Itar says the intent to kill Shechem, but the people came out in his offense, and they found themselves in a war against the entire male population. Rabbi Yaakov Itzak Melchenberg says Shimon Levi learned that the population came to regret the circumcision and were preparing to make a war against Yaakov's family. So they had some inside information and therefore they realized they had to go out to war with these people. Okay. Their act of violence, self-understood. And uh, irrelevant if you agree or disagree, right? See, Yaakov doesn't, so to say, agree per se, with their act, but he accepts initially, as you see in the Torah, he accepts their, their, their reason. And uh, he goes on, life goes on, as we see in the Torah. The, uh, the sikh is, how old is Shimon and Levi at this time? 13 years old. Yeah, but 13 years old. 13. They're 13 years old. It's a long life. Jacob and his family lived to the, in the hundreds. All the tribes lived in their hundreds. So they were not, they lived longer than us. 
Is that so, uh, our list was the 13th? 13. That's what? Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's where. Okay. That's who we learned by mitzvah age. 13. That's it. That's it. Yeah. This is it. So we know that they were by mitzvah, and the Torah calls them ish. The call calls them a man. ish And the man took his sword. Each man took his sword. That means Shimon and Levi were 30 years old. They were not exactly the same age because one was born after the other. So uh, they were born, they were, they were in the same years of the 13-year-old bar mitzvah. And we know that they were 13 because if you calculate the ages of how long Yitzhak, how long Jacob was in Mitzrayim, in how long Jacob was in Choron, until now, is the, we know that, he, that, they, that they were 11 years old when they left. Shimon labor were 11 years old when they left their, fa- their grandfather's house. And now Yaakov tarried for like 18 months, 20 months from in Sukkot. We know he was in Sukkot for 18 months. And then he came to, to, to Shechem. He was there for another two months. This happened two months after he left. We were holding up only 20 months already. So we know that they were 13 years old. question. So the question is even, even, even more, as you just asked, why would we, so really there are three questions here. 13 years old is a magic number. Ish, why does the Torah consider 13 years old a man? You know, in America, you have to be 20 years old to drink, right? <laughs> 21 years old to drink, right? You have to be uh, 21 years old to, to vote, 18 years old to vote, right? 17 to drive. 17 to drive. Yes, could be. You can get, you can get, yeah, in some states you can get 15 uh, a license. Right, correct. So how do we come to 13? Whoever, what, everybody come to 13? Why does Torah give, a, everybody knows 13 year old are not uh, mature enough <laughs> to, uh, to uh, without, in, without con- consulting their father. They acted on the Torah. The Torah called them independent. Yeah. So the Torah says when you're 13, you're a man. You're an independent man. So the question is, what's the magical number 13? Question, question number two is, why would we learn that a man comes 13 from this story, from a violent act. I mean, we could have figured out some wholly a better uh, story to, uh, to, to bring about this number 13 that you're obligated to become a you know, religious observance. That's really what about mitzvah means, the bar mitzvah, the son of commandments. So why would the Torah learn a Son of Commandments, a holy day, and a day of, 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 of a connection to God from a story of Shimon and Levi that did a, a terrible act. And why, uh, and, the, and the third question is, why the rest of the world, Tucker, don't look at 13 years old and any, any uh, we have sweet 16. Why, 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 because uh, a girl is 11 years old, right? A girl is 11 years old. I mean, a girl is 12 years old and a boy is 13 years old, right? So why, why did the Torah pick such dates? Why did the Torah pick dates? The age is very different than what we think. No, no, no. Exact same thing. They were exact same thing. First of all, you should know that Rivka was two years old when she got married. But according to all the sages, she didn't cons- consummate her marriage till 10 years later. So when she said about So she was 13. Yeah. Was young, very young. 15 years old. When she met Yaakov, she was 15. She was 15. Okay. 
Um, other son who was what? No. Okay. Uh, changes. <laughs> what? Children have changes. Yeah, we'll see. Let's go. Let's go into it. Let's go into it. Let's go a little bit into it. Into the Torah way, and even into he brings over here. It's not part of the sicha per se, but he brings in the class modern, you know, psychology in the aspect of what happens when a child happens at 11 to 13. It's actually from 11 to 13. We find actually some great sages who started to put on film at 11 years old. We know that Abbey would start putting on film from 11 years old, even before 13. So it's really, things start to happen at 11 years old, even earlier than 13. We established number 13, but it really starts 11. Really, according to Jewish law, you might even, if a child has certain maturities, we can make him part of the minion even before. In certain traditions that we call 11 or 12 year old to uh, the Torah reading, or they give him half Torah. For example, by the Sfadim, they, they give a child half Torah from 11 years old, the actual reading. They won't call him up to an Aliyah before 13, but they'll, Give them the extra, the mafta, they'll give them starting 11 years. Old. So, no, we don't, we do it with we Ashkenaz and don't do that. We do it at 13 years old. Okay. The Rebbe goes and explains what happens at that age. The Rebbe says the commandment, starting off the Sikha text number three, the commandments became abacultura at the age of 13 a boy and 12 a girl, because it's when we reach maturity in the understanding of empathy. We empathize. That means, according to the Torah, until a child is 13, he, he might have a lot of knowledge, maybe when he's younger. But he's missing one aspect in his life, and that is empathy. Between 11 and 13 or 13? By 13. But it starts earlier. It starts earlier. But it ends, it ends, we know in the Torah itself, the 12 to 13, that, you know, the vows actually start 12 for a boy and 11 for a girl. And really, so we have to know when he makes a vow, that he understand the, he does making the vow out of knowledge, but does he understand the cause and effect of his vow? Does he understand the effect? So if a child understands the way it affects others, now, then we accept the vow even before 30. We go, we go in the Torah from 12 even for a boy and 11 for a girl. But really it solidifies, the Torah say it solidifies at 13 for a boy, and at 12, for a girl, at that time, she's given the capability of empathy. Caring about somebody else. Yeah. And you can have it younger in a way. You can have it, that's I said, 11. But not that it, not, it might have empathy, but not in a way that it's going to affect the way they're going to do things. So we see that kids might even have empathy before that, but not always in the way that it's going to affect the, what they're going to do right now. So they have the caring, but it's not going to show, say, right, it's not going to take action. It's not going to, the empathy is not going to be in, in a way of action. And, I, and every rule has its, uh, every rule has its uh, exception. So the Rebbe says, in the name of, this is the Hashem Dei Ber, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, that explains, to empathize is to really know. One can have concrete understanding of something and still be unable to experience it emotionally. For example, wise children can understand something well, but they can't experience it emotionally. Despite their being intellectually sharp and smart, this is because children lack the ability to really know, namely, 
to develop emotional intimacy and feel the subject on a personal emotional level. And that's why you see children are, are quickly, you know, they're sad quickly and they become happy quickly. It's more the moment, what's happening right now. So they're in pain right now and they can come happy right now because they live in the moment. An adult, everything is more planned out, rationalized. He's thinking about the future. <laughs> Samuel Tzedek once said that in a way we should be more like children because children want to be happy. Adults want to be right. And sometimes it's better to be happy than to be right. Yes. It's better to be happy than to be right. And that's why adults are miserable, because they always want to be right. And they're always miserable. And sometimes, maybe be happy. Be happy. We tell that to God. We tell him on Rosh Don't be right. If you're going to be right, this world is over. Be happy. Okay? Be happy with what you got. It's not totally what you wanted. Be happy with what you got. You know, to, to say the story of the teacher and the father. The teacher, who's the father, right? He makes a rule. He says, whoever's going to get 100 is going to get a price. It's going to get an A, you know? Whoever gets an A is going to get a price. Well, the son who's a student gets a, a B. He says, listen, I'm to the father, he says, listen, dad, I know I got a B, but I think I deserve a price. <laughs> he says, why? I made a rule. You should have some empathy because I could have got a C. <laughs> I, I could have got a C. So be happy that I got a B. Okay. Right? Be happy. And the father says, you know, you're right. <laughs> right? The rule is you have to get an A. But I have some empathy. You're right, because you could have got a C. You could have got an F. So let's be happy. We don't always have to be right. We should sometimes be happy. And maybe if you'll give me a prize for getting a B, next time I'll get an A. That's like the joke you were telling about the the letter to correct, correct, yeah. correct. The same thing, right? Be happy, be happy. Yeah. So, 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 a child that the 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 the, the, the Rebbe Rashab says is very smart. He could be extremely extraneous, but he lives in the moment. He lives right in the now, and therefore he can be extremely sad. If the father will give him a candy, or give him a dollar, or give it, he'll become happy. Happened to your sadness. No, but right now I got that, I got that, I got that, I got what I wanted, so I, I'm happy. I'm, this rule is not only by adults, by children. It can happen to adults too. We can, well, that's the expression in the Mishnah. Don't look at the vessel, but what's in it. You can have a, a very old vessel that doesn't, uh, doesn't have even new wine. You can have a very young vessel that has old wine. So it's always uh, the, uh, the, the adult can act like the child. The same applies to worldly affairs, such as wealth or power. What? No, everything in its, everything in its, every, in its moment. Everything in its moment. Some adults should act, shouldn't be so stringent, and they should act a little bit. That's the point of the, what the Samuel Tzedek said. Maybe adults should act a little bit like a child and be happy and not be miserable because, you know, they, they want to be right. They want to, it's all about the, the being them being right. Everything's relevant. The same applies to worldly fears such as to wealth or power. Children might be right and bright and smart. They might understand wealth and power, but they aren't emotionally attached to it. They don't get what the importance of wealth and power. They don't get what it means to be wealthy or powerful. They don't have the same relationship with money as adults have. 
So adults have a relationship with money. They see what the what the money brings them. Ego. What, what the what what so a child might have say, you know, I'll give all the money away for the now. They don't get it though. Maybe they should put it away and keep it that tomorrow is another day, right? So if it's gonna bring them the enjoyment right now, they'll use the money right now. <laughs> Don't put them bad. Relationship with money, they don't have that relationship with power. So therefore, we don't give money. We shouldn't give a lot of money to children, and give them the right to use their money right now. We can give them the money and and then put it away for a future and have some rules and regulations really on wrong. their money. Right. The same is true the other side of the coin. Children might understand a problem associated with loneliness and poverty but they aren't stressed by those problems. It doesn't give them that stress, right? So therefore, you should, when, you, you, when you bring up children, they shouldn't know the troubles of the family. You don't stand with your children and say, we are having a bad you know, uh, financial situation. That wouldn't be a very good thing to do. Children need to feel safe and secure. And if you're gonna tell them your worries about your financial worries as a child, that's not going to help them in any way because they don't comprehend the ramifications of that concept. They just, they're not, because you don't, they're not going to be distressed in the same way as an adult who will have stress. They might take it bad. They might take it as their whole life is over and everything is done. They, 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 they will never, they, 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 Pastor Shalom, it's, it's, it's a terrible situation and life is done. And, 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 and you don't want the child to feel that. You want a child to feel secure. Yeah. So therefore, you need to protect your child, self understood even though you might be going in a financial issue. Because you understand that, yeah, today is a hard day. Tomorrow might be a, a better day. And in a week, it might change. Things might change. And things will change. There's that touch. A child does not live in that kind of world, even though they understand that the value of it. They might have the intellect. They don't have the emotions. Their emotions are not yet refined to be able to handle these intellectual concepts. They don't feel them as an adult feels them. And therefore, they're different. Abbott explains it in the in text number 4b. The same things with God. Children lack the ability to perceive and feel how precious and valuable a mitzvah is. You just tell them that, that it is, and they, they do it. They don't have a comprehension of the long-term event of this mitzvah. You talk about a mitzvah? Yeah, a mitzvah. Is. And how much we lose when we fail to preserve. So we just, they understand the, the, the action right now. That's why a child... In a way, accepts things the way it is, surface well. That is, you tell them you're praying to God, they pray, oh, we're praying to God. I, uh, we were yesterday at a wedding, and uh, the, a, a reliever got up and said, now is a precious moment to pray to God. So my little granddaughter, she's uh, three years old, you know, she said, you know, she said, we, we have to pray now, like night now is the time to pray to God. Like she took it as face value. That's it. Simplicity. That's it. That's the way it is right now. It will do right now. It's not gonna happen. And let's do it right now. Like you know, because she took it, and that's beautiful. You know, and there was a great there was a great uh, rabbi in the Gemara who said, I wish I could pray like the child prays. Like a little child. Because when you tell him to pray to God, he prays to God. Adult said, is God here? Is God listening? Is <laughs> there a God? Whatever, we have all these qualifications, qualifications. We're looking, oh, is it going to help me for the moment? Is it going to help me for a week? I should maybe pray in a week. I got a problem in a week, not now. So uh, so I'll pray, uh, am I praying too early? Did I pray too late? Yeah, we have all these dilemmas. When a child, you tell them to pray to God. And it doesn't finished, lives in the moment. He doesn't comprehend. He does. So a child, you might, and that's why you should teach a child all about mitzvahs and all about God. He, he is. And later, 
That's what it says. Teach a child, teach a child everything, because he, even though he doesn't comprehend it, but it's in his subconscious ultimately later down the road, when he will understand, he will reflect on the simplicity of his knowledge that he had when he was told it when he was a young child. That's saying yeah. Learn it by heart. Yeah, till now. Talk sukkim. So we did ever wanted that every child should be engraved these sukkim in their mind. Even though many of these kids said these sukkim, they didn't know what they were saying. But they said it with excitement. And uh, by their rallies, they had them up there saying it with excitement that ever love. And these kids, these three-year-olds screaming out these sukkim with such excitement and such gusto and so, such fever and passion that it it was a great thing to see a child say a pasuk with such a, like he knew the pasuk, she knew the pasuk, she knew exactly and God is standing above me and he fills the whole world and he looks into my heart and she said it with, or she said it with such happiness and joy they didn't know what they were saying and they said it with such happiness to say a pasuk in the time the beauty of a child the beauty of a child. So even though we know the child has no understanding and meaning and it's, he doesn't comprehend it, it's a beautiful thing. The simplicity of the hevel shame by chet. A child, is, a, is his breath is, has no sin. So the davening, the Gemara says, the davening of a child, that a, da, a child davens with such simplicity, it's, it's <laughs> his heavy breath of his is, goes up to heaven. Even though you know, don't know what they're saying, and, and they're not emotionally attached to what they're saying. They're just saying it in the moment, but it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But why we do that? It's beautiful. The Gemara says that the, the, the prayers of, of a child has no stoppage. It goes straight to heaven because it's done with total simplicity. It's done with total earnest and simplicity, and there's no but. Not enough, ultimately. We need to have the maturity, the curve, the maturity curve. We need the child to ultimately make the turn and, and become mature about what he's saying and become mature about what he's learning. And that curve, that mature curve comes when the child understands the ramifications of his good and bad. What, the ram, what, what happens when he does good and what happens physically, what happens in the world in the world at large, when he does something bad, not just doing things out of simplicity, but out of maturity, and that happens when a child, when a child comes, uh, when a child comes. Uh, so that's why we emphasize the beauty of Shimon and Levi response. Jacob said, "What a, based on." They said, our violence is based on what happened to our sister. Heard that expression of these two 13-year-olds, that they understood the pain of their sister, it was not that they were just trying to show their power and their anger and their frustration and the moment that we're going to show everybody how we are powerful. Uh, uh, no, no. It had nothing to do with them, their empathy. Suddenly, he's, they said, They said, the pain and suffering that our sister went through, are we going to allow the pain and suffering of our sister not to be responded to? That's when Yaakov understood that they were adults. We're not going to go today. So that's, that's, that, that's the another, that's a different class. That moment is where Yaakov understood that they are men, that they did the curve. They, they did, they, they, they went from children to mature men who understood that they're doing something not for their own emotions, they're doing something for the sake of their sister. Empathy, that's the whole. That's the, that's the power. That's where everything changes. 
And that's why Yaakov Avinu accepts their, 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 their action. And doesn't, Yaakov Avinu is not happy still with their action, and he, but he keeps it quiet for many, many more years. And he waits till his deathbed to tell them the facts of life. And, 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 he's, and, and, and to respond to, the, to what they did many years later. But point of view, the point of view here is the aspect of why the Torah chose to, to mitzvah at 13 years old, because that's when the, the Torah feels that a child and a, a bas mitzvah girl at 12 years old, that a, a man and a girl become, their empathy becomes part of their life at that age. And the question is why? We'll get to that in a moment. He goes to two psychological, you know, professors, and you, you text them, at, we can read it, text them at 5 8. But the notion that a shift in a child's development occurred around the age of 12 fits with the proper model of development in psychology. One notable example is the work of Gene Piggott. Anybody knows? Okay. PJ, I'm saying saying the name right. I apologize, Gene, <laughs> who mapped out four stages in a child's cognitive development. He called the final stage, the beginning around which begins around the age of 11, the formal operation stage. While, while a child in early years mostly uses deductive reasoning. Piaget. Piaget. I'm sorry. Drawing gen general conclusion from personal experience and specific facts at the age. I'm capable of deductive reasoning, specific conclusions from abstract concepts using logic. While children tend to think they're very concretely and specifically in the earlier stages, at the age of 12, they become capable of abstract thoughts and begin to consider possible outcomes and consequences of action. So even psychology, and you see the next word, next, uh, <clears throat> next text, text 5b, this is taken out of the Jew Jewish course of why it was given a class in JLI. In parallel to P. Yeah, okay. PJ's works, thank you. French. Work is the field of cognitive development is Lawrence Kohlberg's work on moral development. Found that until adolescence, children are motivated primarily by self-interest. They behave well because they are rewarded and avoid misbehaving, but avoid punishment. As children enter adolescence, they become more concerned about maintaining a relationship and take other people's perspective and intentions into account when making decisions. Conform to social standards and behaviors and understand right from wrong. So that's the way it is. So if you want to be not a psychologist, so that's we'll go. He gives another. Let's go to text number six. Throughout childhood into adolescence. The, oh, this is the way the, the cortical. So now he's going into the brain. Areas of the brain continue to thicken as neural neurons connect connections connection proliferate. proliferate. In the frontal cortex, gray matter volume peaks at approximately 11 years old in girls. Look at this. And 12 years old in a boy. That's mamish to Tata. That's mamish to 11 year old in a girl and tell you all is Pasha the Tata. Tata starts, says, starts at 11, as I said before, to a girl and 12. You see that by the concept of vows. In the concept of vows, you see this law. Make sure we come to the Torah, the aspect of the Pasha Semen. So here the Torah says 11 years old for a girl and 12 years old for a boy. We Evaluate if they understand what the meaning of the vow, what is the cause and effect of their vow? What is the meaning? What that does the moment? Oh, I don't want to eat bread anymore. What is the meaning of this vow? Well, how is it going to affect you? How is it going to affect others? You make this vow. It will affect your parents. You make this vow. She's not, not you, you, your mother's going to go up with some sugar that you're not going to be able to really do this anymore. Do you understand what this means? If he understands the ramifications, then we accept his vow. Does this have anything to do with like, you can see a very physically mature 11 year old or a very immature one. Is, is this just the age? Well, I don't know. We'll see in a minute. I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't ask you that. I don't know. 
Go look this up. I mean, maybe it's brought down in, in how ultimate in the physical effect. Subsequently, really used can the connections are selective pruned, making the brain more efficient efficient by allowing it to change structurally in response to the demands of the environment. Neural connections that survive the pruning process become more apt at the transmitting information through myelinated. Myelin is a seed of fatty cell material. Wrapped around neural axons acts as insulation for neutral. Okay, guys, you got the picture. Okay, yeah. this allows nerve impulse to travel throughout the brain more quickly and efficiently and facilitate increased integration of brain's activity. Okay, so we see in simple English, I probably don't know what I just said, but in simple it means that in, that in essence, the brain is changed the child becomes mature. Very simple. Okay, Take good. an electrical wire and you put it, it from the other environment, achieving then the electrical circuits of the other wires cross. Right. And that causes things like schizophrenia. So oh. the, the maturity of the brain starts isolating its lines of communication. Better. Okay. Very good, thank you, Rabbi Klugman. We appreciate your uh, Dr. Klugman in your analogy, and we still don't know what you're talking about. Sounds like almost like me when I say some things in Torah. You that Dylan and I would talk about. Okay, hey, that's it. Everything's relative. Let's go to the Torah. I, I talk. So we have according to psychology, whatever whether it's emotionally, intellectual, the brain itself changes in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, literally an improvement okay. of the engine. So the question is, question would be now, so why do, why do, why do, why do, why do we wait in America until 21? Yeah. Why do, why don't we become adults at the, so, oh, because 13, nothing really uh, changes. <laughs> no, my wife says I'm 50, 60, and I haven't changed. So um, uh, nothing really changes, <laughs> right? When a woman has five kids, she says, I really have six kids. But um, so it seems like men never grow up, it, it looks like. So where does it tell you? I mean, why 13? So go look at number seven. We're here. The question was answered by the Rosh, very famous uh, sage. Shukhnarach is based on the Rosh, lived in the 1200s. With respect to your query, how do you know that we become liable for transgression at the age 13? Where do we see that in the title? It says Ish. How do we know when an Ish is? Maybe this guy, he's, a, he's still a child at 50. So what is the meaning that a man is responsible? In the how do you know 13? Where do we see this number? Where do we see? Has to be, there's got to be some... Uh, the Torah, if the because this is not just it's not just some still moral question. The Torah says a man is responsible. A child is not responsible. When does a man become a man? Why can a guy say with sixty years old, I'm still a child? I'm acting like a child. My wife even says I act like a child. So therefore, I'm a child. I'm not responsible. So the Torah, you can't play around with the Torah's law. The Torah says a man is responsible, whether you, whether it's capital punishment, or it's, or it's between man and God, where a man is responsible. A woman, the same question, not to a man, man and woman. We will come up with this number. And the answer is, he gives, he says, no answer to that question. Know that this ruling that God gave Moshe on Mount Sinai and it passed down orally through the generation. For God put Moshe a minimum measurement for every requirement of the Torah. When the Torah says a ma, when the Torah says a saw, when the Torah says all these measurements, how many of these measurements? What do we? Measurement is. So when Moshe Abedu came down on Mount Sinai and said, Ish be Ishta, we'll do A and B. They said, what does that mean? He said, 12, 13, and that's it. <laughs> Ask a question. It's not a question. 
Because if you can ask the question, if you're going to say, maybe that's not true, then you don't have any measurements in the Torah. You have no, when the Torah says, a, 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 what's an ama? It's not, a, it's not the measurement that we know now. What is an ama? Moshe Rabbeinu came down and said what an ama is. That's why we still have an argument today. What's an ama? Because we're not sure exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu said. Some people say it's 12 inches. Some people say it's 15 inches. Some people say it's 18 inches. Some people say it's 24 inches. Is total value or the total value of value? What's the value in the Torah? These are what Moshe Rabbeinu said. So Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the mountain and he said a man is 13 and a woman is 12. That's the way it is. It has nothing to do with it, that he's mature, he's smart, he's stupid, he's immature. 13, he's a man. 12, she's a woman. Meaning, she's obligated in all the obligation what a man is obligated and a woman is obligated in all the obligation. That's it. So that's it. So now you have, in essence, two, two ways to look at it. You have, in essence, two ways to look at it. We can look at it that a man becomes a man because he becomes mature. Or you can look at it, a man because a man, because that's the way it is. That a man or woman, I'm just saying, uh, yeah. like, so a man and a woman become a, a man and woman, either because of you can go through the Dina and this way the Torah learns it, or as this rabbi says it, the Rosh says it, this is the way it is. A man because becomes a man at 13 because God said so, and a woman becomes a woman at 12 because God said so. And that is it. There's no reasoning that you need to go to find reasons to this situation. So there's two modes. As you see, Rebbe, you're going to see, I'm sure we've learned this. We learned with the Rebbe already many years. So it's time to get it already formalized how the Rebbe looks at things. And uh, <laughs> the Rebbe looks at things in two ways, always. In a way where a Jew needs to look at something because that's the way it is. And the way a Jew looks at something to rationalize and to comprehend and to be mature about everything in life. And that is, in chassidus, that is the concept of the connection of the infinite with the finite, that they work together in unison. And that was the Rebbe's way of learning everything in the Torah. And every class I've given here has been the same situation in different, in different clothes and different uh, garments in the Torah. But that's the way the Rebbe looked at everything in the Torah. He took everything in the Torah as to rationalize it and not to be so, so above rationalization, to bring about into, into, into the, into the in, and, and to unison, to bring them in unison, to bring it's one, that they're not contradictory, that we can live with both modes in the concept of our day-to-day -day life. We can live in a natural, in a, in a, in a mature, in a comprehensive, and at the same moment live in a in 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 a sub in a, a super country a com comprehensive aspect to connect the super rational with the rational and that they shouldn't contradict each other but that they actually should live with one another. So that's why the Rebbe says in text number eight, these two options about the starting point of our obligation to worship God represents two entry points into divine worship. According to the first option, opinion, I'm sorry. Worship should begin with the start point of reasoning and knowledge. The ability to serve God in this way depends directly on the state of our intellectual and emotional maturity. Thus, we become obligated to perform mitzvahs when we mature enough to initiate, in, in, to be intuitive in the meaning of the mitzvahs and to relate to them emotionally, according to this opinion. It follows that the portrayal to divine worship is reasoning and knowledge. The second opinion is that the 13 year old accepts the yoke of mitzvahs and obedience to the divine edict, edict relates to Moshe at Sinai. That's it. That's the way it is. Going to this opinion, it follows the portion of the vice is discipline and obedience. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. I better take it or take it. But because uh, you can't leave it either. So that's the way it is. 
So the Rebbe continues, look at the Fidik Rebbe. The Fidik Rebbe said this in 1925, when Jews were under great pressure. It was called the intellectual movement. Uh, the movement was Jews who said, you know what? We are living a chaotic way of life in Judaism. It's time to grow up. Time to, 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 to become more modern. We got to modernize this whole religion. We got we to gotta bring it into the next century. This is before even communism. They were living under the czars. You know, uh, when the communism happened. Whatever. So they were, they were, this was a great struggle. Ultimately, communism tried to force, you know, uh, and, you know. So the Rebbe writes, intellectual Jews today must set aside. He said, you know what the problem is? If we're going to fight with them intellectually, and we're going to go intellectually backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, it's not going to work. Intellectual Jews today must set aside their deductions and refuse to follow their reason and knowledge. This is because they are liable to stray. This is what's happening. If we're not going to get emotionally involved in Yiddishkeit, we're not going to get emotionally involved in Judaism, we're going to lose this fight. We're going to lose this fight. God forbid. Failing cultures of our time and place and conclude that we must change our practices. That's it. Time is time to change. That was a great... The scholar movement was very powerful, and many Jews were lost. So it was called the scholar movement. Many Jews were lost to this movement, right? A certain kind of a way. With time, this can cause straight completely to pass. So the scholar movement was saying, "No, we were at the beginning. They were saying, no, we don't want to go away from Torah mitzvahs. We just want to bring more culture.'" You guys are, you guys are acting like a bunch of, uh, you know, shepherds. If in the past you got to come into the modern era, we got to become like you know, like we got to act like regular people. We cannot act like Jews. We got to show the world that Jews that the Yiddish guy has moved into the new uh, modern age. Uh, but the Friedrich Rebbe fought against this. He said, "You, this is this is the no, no, no. You got to be careful with this. With time, this causes us them to stray completely from the tap of truth. God forbid. It might begin with a minor adjustment. It will lead slowly to progressively to a bitter end. God forbid. Yeah, adjusting the synagogues. That would tell you at the beginning. They said, "Let's just adjust a little bit. Let's just make it a little bit, right?" We went from the, you know, oh, we started from one the step to another. I take the mechitza. Right there, yeah. slowly but surely. Right. Next thing, next thing, slowly we destroy everything. We must therefore be fiercely determined, even to the point of self sacrifice, sacrifice, not to astray even from I iota, God forbid, of the code of Jewish law. If the second we're going to start to play around with the law, I'm going to say, oh, this law, rabbis, this law, the Torah, this law. Uh, you are going on dangerous paths. Torah is eternal for every era and app. And we must stand with firm, never to feel ashamed before whom who mock us. And this was not mocking us by going. This was a letter that was written to the mocking of the Jewish people. And we got to stop this. Uh -huh. Got to stop this. We got to go back to, to our source. And our source is that we do things not because everything has to be rational, but because we are Jews, super rational. And that's why the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, the primary and final state. Why does the Alter Rebbe say the same thing? Why does a bar mitzvah boy obligate, or a bar mitzvah boy obligate to do kalatayda? At 12 and 13, even though it doesn't make rational sense, everybody will agree to that. No 13 year old, 12 year old, not in the Alter Rebbe's time and not in, not in our times, is ready to do Kalatayda. None of them. You no, know, they get up there and they say, Well, I'm ready to do everything like our old head. You're, you're, you're still a child. You're still a child. You're a child. Even though we say you're a man, 
You're a man for one reason, Dr. Levin. You're a man for one reason, or you're a woman for one reason, and that is the primary final state of the sacred soul enter the body at the age of 13 for a boy and 12 for a girl. In the Shama, you received your complete the Shama at the age of 13 years old. You can see the, you complete the Shama at a girl at the age of 12. That's why you're a man and a woman. Not that we expect that suddenly you can become holy. Yesterday you were fighting over candy, and today you're going to be fighting over uh, godliness. It, it's not going to happen in one day. We all realize that. That's why you became a man and a woman, because at 13, your Shama came within you. Whether you feel the Shama or you don't feel your Shama. That's what happened in that moment. So you heard that I've like, said that before. The Torah ish, Torah calls him a man. Man. What is ish? It means Aishud, the fire of God. So Aishud, Yudke, the fire of God's name. That's the word. That's the meaning of you. You put the two together. That's what we say by every wedding. You put the Yudke, the Ish Isha. The yud and hey come together when they get married because you're still not a complete man or a complete woman until you get married. When you have uh, you have completed the yud k, you brought the yud and the hey together. You brought the name of God together. Okay, but that's a separate story. This is why we become obligated to take the commandments at that age. But that's why now that you have an neshama, your neshama, your soul has come completely in your existence. So now you got to do for the neshama. The neshama needs every mitzvah in the Torah. So doing what every mitzvah you can do, because you're neshama. You have a neshama. Everybody said. We so we have to ultimately. So in essence, the, the Rebbe says we're going to use both of them. both of these concepts. We're going to use the concept of your brain, Baruch Hashem, you're 13 years old, it's time to, your, your empathy is, is getting involved, you're starting to care about others, start to care about God, start to care about your soul, start to care about the, not about the Jewish nation, start to care about the community, it's time for that. Relying only on your, your empathy, your, 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 your rationalization. Today you're a Jew. Oh, yeah, I'm putting you to sleep already. Well, let's end it off because he's getting tired on me. So uh, let's go to the, the Rebbe says, this is the text number 11. The concern, will our sister be made a heart, was so distressing to Shimon and Levin that they responded to strangers like people, like, like, like strangers, like strangers, like people who are not the sons of Jacob. They were consumed by the distress over the violation of their sister that their only choice was each man took a sword. This is precisely why we derive the age of our mitzvah from this passage. Message for every bar and bar mitzvah child, which included all Jews at the beginning of stages of their spiritual progression. The lesson is that when we stray from our hearts and our high with lusting urges, we are tempted to sin. We face this, the risk of being made into a harlot. Just as hardly deserves a wedge between a woman and her husband, so does sin form barrier between us and God. We must confront, we must, we are, are to, we are to be, when we are confronted by some, such temptations, we mustn't tolerate any rational justification or moderate response. That's it. You tell about mitzvah boy. Don't start rationalizing your Yiddishkeit already. Don't start rationalizing your Judaism. Don't start saying, oh, I'm young, I'm too young. I want well, to do this mitzvah, I want to do math mitzvah, it's too much problem, it's too much a headache. It's too Trust me, this has nothing to do by mitzvah. We all do this. So stop rationalizing every mitzvah. Get emotional. Get emotional. 
Our only response should be, can be stop your resistance to sin. Get a sword and kill your sin. Kill your hate. Sitting there and rationalizing. <laughs> Even to the point of self-sacrifice. That's it. You got to take your sword. You got to fight your evil inclination. Suddenly you're going to sit there and rationalize with your evil inclination. You're going to sit there and, and contemplate and motivate and, 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 and have a whole, a whole conversation. No, there's no time for conversations. Only after being inspired to self-sacrifice do we have the luxury of serving God in a fashion that follows our reasoning. Once you're ready to go and self-sacrifice for Yiddishkeit, once you're ready to go and self-sacrifice for Yiddishama, like the Alter Rebbe says, why don't you have a on your soul? Like, have you think about the soul? No, we don't think about the Nishama. It's your sister. So in Kabbalah, you, the soul is called your sister, the soul is called your wife. Call it whatever you want to call. Care about the Nishama. Do we care about the We say, oh, I left the Nishama, the Shabbat. Worry about it later. I'll worry about it after 120 years. Baba Nisham. That's where you care about your Nishama. That's the way we care about our sister. We're ready to, I don't, know, I don't want to say the word harlot, but that's the word with the Teddy. You were ready to sell your sister to, 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 to anything. And Hazani and, Asaka and, and, you're ready to sell, to, to give your sister away, to, to give your Nishama away to every woman and, 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 and the thing. And you're not ready to stick up for it. You're going to rationalize this? You're going to sit and rationalize this? You're going to say your neshama can handle it? What? Your sister can handle it? My, our sister can handle the shame? My neshama can handle the shame? Get up and... Oh. Look, his sister is so... No, we don't. We need to teach it. But the truth is, we need to teach this ourselves. Shimon married... <laughs> Shimon married Rachel. Shimon married Rachel. Shimon married Rachel. Shimon married In, in former school, they do. In the new school, you do. And go missing seven. You cannot rationalize everything because with rationalization, you, if somebody hurt your, 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 your family member, you become rational. You're going to start sitting and, 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 and having a conversation and having a contemplation. If somebody hurt you or your, your sister, if somebody hurt your family, you're going to sit there and think about it. You're going to go on, you're going you're gonna, to you're say this has to be taken care of. You get emotional. Why don't we get emotional? And our neshama is being thrown to the wind. So the thing, having a knee-jerk reaction. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Right now, his father accepted. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Later on, we'll get to that. Later on, we'll get to that. But right now, right now, that's the response, and, the, and Yaakov Inu accepts the response in the Torah. We'll, we'll worry about that later. But right now, Yaakov Inu accepts it. They had to, they they had to do what they do, and God accepts it. You see, two, the verse later, God says, don't worry, I'll, if you're worried about the nations, I'll put the fear upon the nations. So Yaakov Inu, Yaakov Avinu, his response to them is, I'm worried about the people. I'm worried about the nations of the world. Not that he didn't challenge them. Why did you do such a violent act? He challenged them. That he challenged later. <laughs> that, that, now he challenged them, the nations of the world. And God responds, don't worry. Chit us. Learn chit us every day and the nations of the world will leave you alone. I'll put the fear of God upon them. And care about their sister. It's about their sister to be violated in such a way. The response. So what is the response to us? The trader says, I learned, the trader says, I, the trader says you should learn. Not that you should accept it only because God says so, that you're 13 when you're 13. You should learn from here. That's how you put the two concepts together. God says, I want you to learn from this story. From this story. To learn 
And when it comes to a concept of negative concept, don't rationalize a negative concept. The second you start rationalizing a negative concept, you... Again, give excuses. I don't know. Okay. Uh, give excuses. Uh, not, to, not to respond. You know, oh, let's not respond. Let, let's, let's take it easy. Let's negotiate. That's it. No, don't negotiate with, with my eight daughter. I shouldn't have a negotiations. Sometimes. I'm saying sometimes. Sometimes you need that. It's relative. Sometimes. Don't have a nego- every time is a negotiation with the Yetzirah. You have to take your sword and get ready to go to war with the human inclination. You have to, when you're ready, so the point is like this, I think the point is like this. If I'm ready, if the foundation is that I will never I'm going to go out to war, now we can have negotiation. Yes, if my, if, if, like the Rebbe would say, you negotiate with power, yeah. not negotiate with weakness. Yeah. Correct. If you negotiate with weakness, you're lost. You negotiate with power. That's the way you negotiate. You end up in the world, and a yid has to learn that also. You negotiate with power. Yaakov told Asa, I'm willing to give you everything. But if you want to go to war, I will go to war with you. Okay? I'm not negotiating with weakness. I'm willing to, to have shalom peace in a, in, in a peaceful way. If not, I will, just, I, will, I will go out to war with you. I'm not negotiating. I'm not giving you this mincha because I'm a schlepper. I'm a weak guy, and I, 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 I'm a loser, and I'm not going to, and I'm a, no, 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 no. If I need to go to war with you, I will go to war with you, and I will destroy you. But I want to negotiate. And so too, Yetzirah. If you have, you're, you're telling Yetzirah, I'm ready to go, I'll, 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 if I need to, I will, I, will, I will totally not listen to you. But you know what? Let's negotiate. Let's talk. I'm willing to talk, but I'm not willing to talk out of weakness. I'm willing to talk out of strength. And that's the way you need to do it. So that's how you put the two things together. That's what the Rebbe says. Only after inspired self sacrifice do we have the luxury. If we're ready to go on self-sacrifice, if we're ready to go on self-sacrifice, not to do an Aveda, if we're ready to go on self-sacrifice, this guy, now we have the luxury to fashion and follow our reasoning, and then we can, we can play around with reason and comprehension and say, okay, but if I don't have, if I'm not ready to self-sacrifice, then the reasoning will bring you down. Reasoning will bring you down. So, so the question is, why did the, why did the scholar movement want to uh, <laughs> give away Yiddishkeit? They felt, no, we'll keep Jews together, we're, but we have to give away Yiddishkeit. No, 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 no. We need to keep Yiddishkeit where it is. And now, how do we bring the people in, into, into, into the situation? How do we not stop losing people? Yiddishkeit. Not to bring Yiddishkeit down, to bring people in. Mm-hmm. I agree. Out of, out of strength, not out of weakness. Yeah. Not that we're schlappers. Oh, no, out of strength. Strength. Again. I'm going to say, I'm, uh, I'm not going to give in to my Yetzirah, but I have to now explain my Yetzirah, so I have to negotiate with him. I have to explain to him how we're going to eat the Shem Shemayim. I'm willing to eat the Shem Shemayim. I'm going to eat for the sake of heaven. So I'm going to, I'm going to eat. Don't worry, Yetzirah. We're going to eat. So I can finish. We're going to eat good food also, but I'm going to eat the Shem Shemayim. I'm going to eat for the sake of heaven. And then the eight times, okay, fine. At least I'm getting my, I'm getting my steak. So, uh, but you eat the shemesh. But if, it, it, right, yeah, let them throw. You have to give him that. You have to give him some understanding. You got to give him some, 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 some concept. Or else he's gonna, never going to, he's never going to be satisfied. So we give him something. We give him. It's okay. Says Hiller would say, would stop learning. He'd say, no, I, I got to go now. Give my give something to my 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 physical side of me. I gotta go. go I gotta go. Piece of the, the body. So let's go eat. Really, 
I'm a little learning. I'm enjoying the learning, but we have to appease the body. So let's close the book now and go and eat, satisfy the body, and we'll come back to, to the study. What? <laughs> I'm not alone. Um, however, follow the Torah. So that follows reasoning. So the Torah says you should 100% have reasoning. Why should the Torah? The Torah wanted reasoning because that makes happy the human being. We human beings. Our soul needs reasoning. Our soul needs God. The more Godness it has, the more he be better. The body, our nefesh abamis, our, our rational side of us need to have reasoning. We need to throw it a bone. Hey, we need to throw it to something to keep it going. Not we're going to feel like robots or whatever, all these reasoning. Oh, I'm doing things above reasoning. But really, the truth is everything you do, even the reason that you, you think reasoning is not the real reason, might be a much greater reason, a deeper reason, etc. You know, Sidis or Kabbalah. That follows our reasoning and measured pace of Torah dictates. However, for our reason, service to God to endure, our reason should endure. That's the problem. There's always somebody who's going to have a better reason. There's always somebody who's going to come and challenge you intellectually. And then your reason will not endure. At the age of a mitzvah must be stubborn determination that transcends all reasoning. That needs to be the platform. That needs to be the foundation. The foundation is to be, Kabbalah said, I'm ready to go to do what is right. There's no reason. And now let's go and reason it. That's why Dafka by Yidin is 13. <laughs> and the rest of the world is not. A Jews is 13. Nobody in the world accepts that a man becomes a man at 13. And a, and, and, and a woman becomes a woman at 12. No, not America, not any country will accept this. The Rebbe says, look at the Rebbe 12. Jewish children reach maturity at 13 years of age. Unlike other nations. With age of adulthood is 20, 21, whatever. The reasoning, the nations form their national identity by first setting a common land rather than wandering about or shepherding. They appoint a king and finally establish a constitutional law. The history of the Jewish people is the total opposite. As they soon as they left Egypt, while still in a desert, they began to follow the trade and its commandments. That's our foundation. Our foundation is not a country or a land or a kingship or, a, or who's going to be the who's going to be the government, who's not going to be the government. Our foundation is God, trade and mitzvahs. And from there we build everything. From the trade and mitzvahs we come to everything, to a land, to a king, to laws. Blah, 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 everything comes out of that. That's the beauty. As soon as the left Egypt, they, they, they were still in the desert, they began to follow the commandments. This was their foundation and the portal to nationhood. This is why Jews don't enter into adulthood when they are 20 and strong enough to defend the land, that they become the age of 13. <laughs> no capabilities. Sure enough to begin to understand the great privilege ability of being sure. And that's the way it goes. That's the way it is. God bless you all. Beautiful Sikha Mirabba on the Pasha. May we have a